I live and breathe. Okay, so I want to tell a funny story. So I was in South St. Paul last night um, uh, at a uh, work session for the city council. And I was introduced as Diana McCowan, which only seemed appropriate in South St. Paul, but I'm bunch. <laughs> so, uh, are we ready, Patrick? Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> right? Funny. She's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, that's okay. Um, so I am Diana McEwen, Q, and, and um, I am the Metro CERT coordinator, which I'm sure not many of you know what that is. So I coordinate the metro region, 11 county metro region, of a statewide program called CERT, Clean Energy Resource Teams. And we are one of the founding partners of the Green Step Cities program. I also happen to be employed by Great Plains Institute, which is also a partner of Green Step City. So I'm like a double dipper. Um, uh, we started several years ago with one workshop and then a couple workshops and then three and then five and then eight and then now 10. So um, this was like the idea that we had, I had, that like became its like own behemoth. And it's really exciting because honestly this year because of the webinar, um, intro, like we toyed with it last year, but this year with the real webinar, like access, all the cities across the state really can participate. <clears throat> so, but you don't get donuts if you're on the webinar. Sorry. Um, so, super excited. For the second year in a row, we have Excel Energy as our series sponsor. <laughs> Help bring this to you. We're based here. We are coming from you live from the League of Minnesota Cities in St. Paul, right, Danielle? That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> um, so I am here to help introduce this workshop. Um, one of our fabulous partners, Preservation Alliance of Minnesota, has really helped put this together. I think a lot of cities are thinking about their buildings and their, especially old towns. I come from White Bear Lake. We have a lot of old buildings. And so thinking about how do you what do you do with those old buildings? Rehab, repurpose, um, you know, the third part? Reuse, all that. So um, we're here to talk about that because those buildings, they're built and they last for a long time. You can, re, you can reimagine them, if you will. And so lots of opportunities and lots of really good resources through the Main Street program and other programs. And so very, very excited to introduce Aaron who will talk a little bit about the definition, the legacy. So, say it again. Civic legacy. Civic legacy. And, and really, like, looking how do you in <coughs> those buildings. So, Aaron. Thank you. Sorry. Switch. Oh. Alrighty, so my name is Erin Hannafinberg. I'm with the Preservation Alliance of Minnesota. I'm the uh, Preservation Support Services Manager, and I've been with the PAM um, since 2008. Um, so over that time, we've seen um, a lot of trends emerge, and uh, a couple of years ago, we identified one of those trends as being um, uh, that cities were prone to uh, facilitating the destruction of their historic resources. <laughs> in a way that's a little uh, maybe confrontational, but we'll get around to uh, talking about it a little more in depth. Um, this one, right? Okay. So, uh, as I said, I started in 2008, and the first few years of my job were really getting to know the state and getting to know the issues of the state. My uh, position was grant funded at that time, so we were able to take a little bit of a uh, not necessarily wise, but necessary at the time, shotgun approach to dealing with preservation. So I kind of traveled the whole entire state, talked to a whole lot of people, uh, tried to intervene in a lot of last minute decisions. Um, and the trends that we saw emerging at that time, um, I think it's abated somewhat, I'll get to that, but um, was that there were a lot of buildings that were being torn down when there could have been other alternatives that were considered. Um, one of the ones that hit hardest uh, for us 
was the demolition of the uh, county-owned Jackson School in Jackson, Minnesota. This is a building that had been used by Jackson County um, for decades as their social or their service center. Like this is where uh, senior services were, veteran services, um, a lot of those county functions. Uh, they had re already repurposed this old school building for that use, and yet. When, uh, when the need arose to do some work to it, they decided rather than invest, continue to invest in that building. It was built as a uh, work progress administration built uh, project during the Great Depression. Rather than invest in that, they decided to tear it down. Um, and there, it wasn't without a little bit of debate and controversy, uh, but ultimately, um, despite a lawsuit by a lot of very concerned citizens, that building was demolished um, and there was a new uh, facility constructed in its place. So that hit us hard on a number of levels because we've been advocates for the building. We tried to help uh, the county uh, tr consider some reuse alternatives um, and instead the building ended up as a heap of rubble. Um, and there were a bunch of people who had really con concerned citizens who had really engaged in that um, and lost some very, very painful lawsuits and additionally a lot of money in that process. Um, so that was one that was really quite a sucker. Um, then not too long after that there was the demolition of a city-owned house in Little Falls. Um, seemingly without a whole lot of public debate it was just the city had kind of made this decision and gone forward um, and the next thing you know this house which could have been repurposed for any number of uses sold to somebody else who could have found a different use for it um, ended up being demolished. Um, we actually engaged the Preservation Alliance as well as the National Partner, the Cultural Landscape Foundation, um, engaged with uh, the city, engaged is maybe not the right word. We stood the city of Minneapolis over there, um, <laughs> proposed demolition of TV Plaza. Um, TV Plaza is actually a modernist landscape uh, that is eligible, well it was at the time eligible for listing in the National Register. It has since been listed. I mean, it's a very significant work of architecture. And we think, in its payday, was a really vital place that drew thousands of people to downtown Minneapolis and served a really unique function for the city that doesn't have a lot of um, gathering, public gathering spaces right in the core of downtown. Um, so we knew what PV Plaza could be if it was revitalized. Um, and yes, that does have some problems. We fully acknowledge that there's some issues that need to be addressed there, but we didn't think that a wholesale replacement of the plaza was the way to go about that. Um, and when the city was um, driving forward with a plan to remake that, and we actually stepped in, as I said, with our partners, the Cultural Landscape Foundation, to the city, uh, reached a settlement with the city, which is now actually, this, later this afternoon, I will be attending a meeting um, because there's, the city has been doing some work to identify the, um, the conditions of the building with the hope that there will be um, a plan for rehabilitation in the future. So they have recommitted recognizing the value of this place and um, and we are hopeful that it will result in a revitalized historic people plaza. Um, at the same time all of these things were happening, uh, the city of St. Paul was planning to redevelop the site where their public safety building is um, or was. Uh, right now it's, it's the Penfield block, um, so not too far from downtown here. And um, what they ended up doing in that case was taking the skin, the front the front of the building, storing it for a while, and then slapping it back on this new building. That's not really preservation. <laughs> you know? uh, I don't know that it saved any money. I don't think that it saved a really particular resource. Um, but the city was really adamant that they wanted this block redeveloped, no matter what was on it already. Um, and what was on it was a really, really interesting, uh, vitally, historically important building that could have probably been repurposed, just not the way the city had in mind. Um, there have been votes to demolish the city-owned uh, Litchfield Opera House that has since been purchased by a nonprofit organization, mostly volunteer-led nonprofit organization, and they are revitalizing their opera house for public use, which is a fantastic story. Um, there has been the threatened demolition of a county-owned jail up in St. Louis uh, County in Duluth. Um, that, I think, is still in limbo, actually. It's a pretty hard property to redevelop, but it was sold to um, a private owner who had plans to repurpose it for something. Um, and then there had also been even, there, there are other things other than buildings that can, can be considered important historic assets, um, including like the old Cedar Avenue Bridge. That is now, I'm very happy to say, being uh, rehabilitated and it will be a pedestrian and bike and walking um, 
trail across the, the lower Minnesota River Valley, which is yeah, fantastic. Um, but that was not also without controversy within the city of Bloomington. So uh, all of these things are kind of conspiring. And as I'm traveling around the state and getting to know the issues, I'm like, oh my gosh, I think that the number one threat to historic buildings might be local government. <laughs> oh no, what do we do about that? Um, so we, we took out some cues from our neighbors. Um, there's a lot of things that we won't admit as Minnesotans that Wisconsinites do better than us. Maybe we'll give them the cheese. Maybe we'll give them some of the beer. Don't say football. No. Oh, no. Thank oh, my you. Gosh. No. Never. Killing me. No. But I uh, won't say football. Um, but one of the things that they have done is they're, they're pretty good at taking stock of their historic assets and really investing in those as ways to, um, to bring vitality and recognition to their small communities, especially throughout the state. Um, they, unlike us, don't have a functioning statewide nonprofit organization, the equivalent of PAM. Um, so that was one of the places we thought, well, okay, we'll give ourselves a pass back. At least we have that. Um, but what are we doing to really help develop the kinds of things that they're doing in Wisconsin? So I brought a copy of the book. You guys can thumb through it if you want. But they had like pages and pages of profiles of historic buildings and what it took um, from a civic investment standpoint what kind of philanthropic support they were able to get, what kind of like state money they might have needed um, to really invest in a lot of their historic assets. Um, so they put together this report back in 2010. It was up on, um, there's a, still a web link that's active if you want to look on it and see more of the details there. But we're, we really used this as a model for the kinds of projects that we could do to try to help promote the value of these places as resources that could be um, opportunities for reinvestment. So we developed a project on a much smaller scale because again, there's some ways that we're not quite equivalent to Wisconsin and one of those is in our preservation funding. So uh, rather than do a nice multi-page book, we did a leaflet. <laughs> but uh, a leaflet and a banner exhibit, which the banner exhibit actually is out and around traveling the state. That was our intention from the get-go was that this, uh, this exhibit would be able to be borrowed by communities and presented if they had an issue or an opportunity that they wanted to kind of uh, present to their communities that they could put these banners up in their historical society or in the post office or their city hall or at a, a community festival or any of those kinds of things and present that as um, some kind of some precedent that their city might be able to follow. Um, so the banners right now have been in Cold Spring, uh, Minnesota near State Cloud. Uh, for the last month or so. They had a, um, a, some kind of home improvement fair or something like that that they wanted to borrow them for. Um, so I don't have them with me now, but we do have this content still available up on our website. I'll give you the web address in a minute. Um, and I do have the leaflet that we produced, which kind of gives the basics um, of all of these 18 sites that we looked at. Um, front and back. So there was interiors and exteriors. Um, I want to point out, because I don't have another slide about it, Right now, it's just the, oh, I just took it off, sorry. But just the pointer, this one? Yeah, all right. So this up here, number two, uh, the Big Fork City Hall. Um, at the time that we started this project, which was the summer of 2012, um, this, this building had been newly identified as eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. It's now undergoing a $300,000 rehab, um, or more than that, actually. I know that they've gotten $300,000 in grant funds. So um, there's, there's kind of a process of incremental steps, but it starts with identifying what your resource is and then figuring out how to get the resource, the money, and uh, community support to have that completely rehabbed. So we'll keep an eye on that one and hopefully profile it um, or give an award or something like that in a year or two when the work is all done. Um, but anyway, we've looked at 18 different historic landmark properties across the state. Um, and our intention was to look at things that were of a variety of sizes, scales, funding sources, ownership scenarios, um, to, to kind of give a whole range of examples for how cities could either themselves reinvest in properties or promote the reinvestment of a property, even if it's something that they don't actually own. Uh, so this was a, um, a, a grant that we received through the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Fund that's operated by the Minnesota Historical Society. It's an excellent source of funding support for historic preservation and any kind of uh, asset identification kind of project. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the webinar. Um, 
we got a small grant, a very small grant that went way over budget in terms of the actual time that we put into it. Um, but we were able to hire a part-time intern to undertake the project. Um, and we <coughs> continued our research and travel throughout greater Minnesota to, uh, to get these stories collected, get some of the details about the project, put it together in a banner exhibit, as I said, that can now travel around the state. Uh, we printed a whole bunch of these leaflets. We're about at the end of our stack, but there are some few, a few on the back table there. Um, we also put a whole, all this content up on the web. Um, it's, we just rebooted our web page, actually, so it's not on our new web page, but I, I put the link where you can find it if you uh, want to look at this, which is on our archives page. And all of the information is the same as our other page, except for it has archives.mnpreservation.org, and then it's civic hyphen legacy. Um, and then we actually hired also a professional photographer, because one of the things that we know about historic buildings is they're fabulous assets, um, but they really shine if somebody knows photography takes a picture of them. So um, we, we were really, really pleased with uh, how that turned out. Um, as we were trying to evaluate which properties to include, we started with a list of the state grants and aid recipients. So in addition to the legacy funds that are available through the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants, um, the Minnesota Historical Society also administers a program called State Grants and Aid. And this is a program that's funded through bond, uh, bonding appropriation. Um, they're passed through grants, and they have to be publicly owned buildings, and I think they also require a match. Um, typically, these funds have been used for courthouse uh, renovation or city halls. They have to be publicly owned buildings. Um, but, but the program has been in, in place for quite a while. There's hundreds of eligible properties. And as we found out, there were literally hundreds of projects that had been funded through this. Uh, and that is an ongoing grant grant program. It, it depends a little bit here. The resources depend on the bonding appropriation. Um, and I think since the legacy funds are uh, a more consistent source of funding, more people have gone to that recently. But these funds are still available. It should be considered. Um, and as I said, we looked at a whole range of projects so that we would have some ideas of um, the different kinds of building types and uh, what motivated uh, communities to do the project. So I will just profile a few of them for you. Um, one that was really interesting was this little townhouse, or schoolhouse rather, in rural McLeod County. This was not one that was actually funded through any grant support, um, but it was, uh, you know, obviously a rural schoolhouse, and um, they decided that they should have a levy, a $25,000 three-year um, levy, to do a $65,000 rehab. This is where they vote. This is where the source of their community meetings. Um, it's not a very populous, well-populated township. Um, still thought, you know, this is the one historic asset that's truly community owned. We should reinvest in that. Um, so they've done this beautiful rehab of uh, their primary school building. They're a little bit stymied in the use of this building because it doesn't have well water. It doesn't have um, any kind of potable water, so they can't do any like catering or uh, they really don't even have very accessible restroom facilities. Um, so there's some some hurdles still to this being a truly functioning community space. Um, but for $65,000, I mean, like most of us have done that level of work to your yard, you know, like there's. $65,000, especially when you apply it over a township in over three years, is really kind of a drop in the bucket. And, um, and they have this really nice, nice project to show for it. Um, so there's a lot of potential here, and hopefully they'll continue to invest. Um, the Hotel Atwater was a really interesting um, situation because this building had been vacant, was privately owned by um, a local citizen who intended to do a rehab on it, and just kind of like kept on running into roadblock after roadblock and wasn't able to get that done. Finally, she decided, maybe I'll just give it to the city. And the city has since renovated it and repurposed it as their city office building. Cool. Um, so what had been a private building is now um, publicly owned. Um, they, at the time, had been considering what should we do with our city hall? Like, where should we, we need a, 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 a new city building. Maybe we should just build a pole shed. Like, that was literally the conversation. Should we build a pole shed? And one of the city council members said, no. We need to really invest in the stability of this community. Let's let's build something or do something that is a testament to our uh, longevity and our stature as a community. So rather than doing a somewhat a pull shed, um, they bought this hotel at Water and invested in it. They got a $200,000 worth of grant funds um, from the Minnesota Historical Society, 
match that with some general funds from the city. Um, and then they've rehabbed the ground level as their city offices, their police offices, a library. Um, and then they've left the upper story vacant for now. They had to re-roof it and um, do some stabilization. Uh, but you'll, as you'll see in a- Wait a minute. Could, did, yeah. did she sell it for a dollar? Did I yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. And then she was a very civic-minded Nice. Person, but, yeah. I would buy it for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, these are some of the, the photos of the, the interior lobby space and then the, uh, the exterior uh, front entrance that was rehabilitated. And then uh, the library space on the left there. And then, as I said, the up, upper story they left unimproved with the idea that this can be uh, expansion space for the city if the city has need for that. Or this might be an opportunity to do some income producing for the city as their business district grows. And that was the other thing too, that one of the, the reasons that they chose to invest in this property rather than on the outskirts of town and build a pole shed was that they knew they needed to do something to help bring some activity back down to their main street. Um, there had been a number of closing and um, languishing buildings or businesses on their main street. And so they thought, well, if we have a city function like the library, people visit the library and while they're visiting the library, they might actually window shop or go in and buy something or, you know, stop and get coffee someplace or all those kinds of things that kind of lead to increased visits. So um, they, that was one of the reasons they committed to this downtown um, location for their new city hall. And then, as I said, they, they left the upper story vacant with the hope that as business and activity increases, they might actually be able to fund the rehabilitation and, um, and build out of this upper story, and then that would bring actually more activity downtown. Uh, the Kimball City Hall is another one where they have just bit by bit ticked away at getting this building rehabbed successfully. Um, and it, it's the only National Register listed building in their whole entire uh, city. I think it's also the only city hall that's on the National Register in their county. Um, so they take great pride in that and they're uh, really excited about all of the work that they have done. It's been led by the Kimball Area Historical Society um, and they've done a whole bunch of really creative fundraisers. fundraisers. They've gone door to door. They promote this at every one of their community festivals. Um, they wanted to show that this had a broad base of support, so that was part of the reason behind the door-to-door -door campaign. Um, as I said, they've done a bunch of little grants that have all added up to a pretty significant investment in the building. Five phases of work altogether in identifying the needs and doing some HVAC work and uh, replacing windows with accurate reproduction windows, exterior masonry work, things like that. Nibbling away at it bit by bit. One of the things that's also really fascinating about this building too is I think a lot of people when they look at buildings that have undergone changes over time, if it's a historic building that's been, um, there's not a popular word in, in preservation circles, remodeled. You know, you remodeled it, but you kind of make things worse in the process, you remodeled it. So this is a classic example of a remodeled city hall. You know, like this used to be the large assembly space, uh, ballroom, um, you know, it, it was that multi-purpose small town facility. So they had a stage at one end and this is where everybody gathered. Well, at some point when they made it into city offices, they just said, we'll just ram a wall right down the middle of it um, and, and, you know, divide the space into what we need. Well, the Kimball Area Historical Society and the people in Kimball could have said, we've kind of messed up this building. There's really nothing we can do with it. Look how ugly it is with this wall down the middle. Or they could say, let's just work around the wall for now. We know that's a temporary solution. If we did it first, we can undo it in the future. So they have invested in all of the historic aspects of the building that are visible and apparent. And at some point, they'll get to taking down this wall, which has fake wood paneling on the other side. It's really not attractive. Um, <laughs> but you don't see that from this side of it. That just looks really nice. And then they have uh, all those photos on the wall actually are all historical um, images of the city. So they really promote their history through this space as well. Um, they've also done some work on the upstairs, and this is um, an interesting, uh, much like the Atwater example where they want to use the upper story for offices or other things like that. That was always the intention of this building. There was a dentist's office and other um, small businesses, uh, like an insurance salesman or something like that, in the upper uh, level of this building at the front street level. So uh, they rehab some of those spaces and they now use it as the um, home of their historic society. 
Mark Larson is going to talk a lot about the Henry Hill School, which is now the Glencoe City Center. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a teaser with a photo because uh, this is a project that we really, really admire. And hopefully he will talk about what prompted uh, this work in their community. Um, it was one of the reasons I really admired is because I didn't even know that it was happening until it was done. Like nobody called me in crisis and said, "Help, we need you." <laughs> and so I was like, "Wow, look at you know when when there's community will in a way, people get really great things done, and it's really nice to see that happening um, outside of a crisis, which is usually what people call it." Um, but just as a little bit of a teaser, they identified that there was a need for an event center, um, which led to this partnership between the City Council and the Chamber of Commerce. This is, a, as I understand, a $5.3 million project, which had a variety of funding sources from DEED, a local challenge grant that was given um, by an area uh, family foundation, lots of private donations, and they also had some city bond funds that were in there. Now it's home to city offices, a senior center, this really beautiful multi-purpose event center. Um, their public library is up on the second floor. Um, and they do have some unfinished spaces, or at least the last time I visited, they did. Um, so there uh, are some opportunities for expanded reuse. And then it was just recently listed in the National Register of Historic Places. They actually kind of went around about things a little bit backwards. Usually people will get things National Register listed and then use grant funds and other things to get us to building rehab. And in this case, they actually did the work first and then nominated it to the National Register. Um, one of the other things that about this property, though, that is, is particularly um, heart-wrenching a little bit to me is that the first time I visited this space, recognized that this was the exact same architect who had done the Jackson School building that had recently been demolished. And you can just tell them the detail. So many of the characteristics were the same. And they have that shared, now what is the, the event center? It's a shared uh, gymnasium and auditorium space. All of the same uh, fixtures and um, details and configuration. So uh, to see this beautifully rehabbed building and know that this is what Jackson could have had if they would have only have reinvested in that building rather than tear it down was just like a, whoa, wake up moment. Uh, but this is the event center here, actually, uh, set up for a wedding. And this is that combined uh, the view back towards their auditorium space. And they use this all the time for city council meetings, for uh, community meetings, for receptions like this, polka festivals and bands and things that tour and come to the, the facility. And Mark will tell us a whole bunch more about that. And this is their library space upstairs, which is a really Great reuse for a second story. That was the other thing too. And a lot of opportunities um, when we've been asked to um, to come to a community and talk about what what might exist, people are tend to be very have a knee jerk reaction to having any kind of facilities on the second floor. Um, and and in this case, is what I understand too. Is initially the librarian was like, no, not on the second floor. Well, with an elevator and accessible, which you need to provide pretty much for any kind of accessibility through a multi-story building. That elevator is just as accessible as any other space um, in the building. And uh, because it, this is like a long, all along the front of the building, essentially, it's a nice, big, uh, open space for the library. I've taken my kids here, too, and they love it, actually. <laughs> That's why when we were driving through and uh, they romped around in the kids' area, it really sounds great. Um, we also profiled the uh, Paramount Theater in St. Cloud. Um, hopefully, in a couple of years, when we're doing this, we can profile the Palace Theater here at St. Paul. Um, because theater spaces are a really, really great uh, historic asset to a community, and but they're, they're expensive. There's no doubt that they are really, really expensive to rehab. Um, what is really great about this project is um, the level of uh, how it's been programmed and used now that it's the Paramount Center for the Arts. I think really presents a great model for how to keep people invested in this space. Um, this is a five and a half million dollar renovation that they did in the late 90s. Uh, multi, multiple funding sources and ended up being transferred to the city of St. Cloud after having actually been initiated as a housing and redevelopment authority project. Um, the Paramount Arts, Paramount Arts Theater a Resource Trust was established and now manages the building, has an art center, uh, programs all of the use of the auditorium space. Um, but the business model is really unique. And one of the things that they say is, even though this is we're set up as a fine arts center and this is clearly a fine arts facility, we want to make sure that it's programmed every single day of the year. And so we will have wrestling matches. We will have 
country western concerts. We'll have hard rock concerts. We'll have anything that uses the space, both because it generates revenue for it and helps it be more self-sustaining, but also because it brings everybody from the community in. And if every person in our community has a reason to attend this space, then they see it as part of their space and they will be willing to continue investing in it as their space. So the more opportunities there are for people from different walks of life to interact with this space and see it as part of their own story, the more sustainable it will be as a city resource for the future. Um, they also did a really creative way of reducing the, the seating capacity so that it actually can serve as a viable theater space. You know, theaters are one of those things where you have to kind of hit that sweet spot of demand and, uh, and space accommodation. Um, and they figured out, you know, 700 or so seats is a good size theater for our community. This is too big. How do we reduce that? And then what can we do with that extra space? Um, and they use it for, for our related programming. So you actually don't see much of the, the theater from the outside other than its marquee. It's kind of wrapped around the back of the building. But on the interior, there's, been, there's beautiful ornate plaster. Um, a lot of the kinds of details that couldn't be reproduced today, too. So that's another thing. It's like these are really unique resources that could never be funded um, if you to that level, um, especially as a city project. This is an example here. Of, so this used to be the back of the house. Um, and so this is part of the open up this lobby and now they can use this for all kinds of other events, um, receptions and openings and things like that. It's more of a gallery space rather than just a corridor. Um, we were really inspired by the work that they've done in Deep River Falls, um, partly because this reuse of their historic depot as their city hall is a project that they undertook a couple decades ago now. It's kind of old news, <laughs> Deep River Falls, um, but it was a really creative use of, um, of what had been just a languishing depot property. And this so obviously was one that was privately owned by the railroad. And then the city identified this as an opportunity for them to have a, a city, uh, city offices and city council chambers in a location that would be really viable for the city, but also was a way to reuse a historic asset that was clearly not going to ever be used as a depot again. Um, so they, uh, in the mid 90s, they started a public fundraising campaign and immediately raised over half a million dollars to contribute to this. And then the city agreed to come on board and to do the rest of the project, uh, which they did through private fundraising. There used to be a lot of uh, grant funding available through uh, the federal government through a program called ICE-P, which was uh, transportation enhancement related funding. Um, and then the city financed the rest. Um, but they you know, kept a lot of the historic features, like um, one of the, you know, uh, Ticket booths is now uh, the billing department uh, table. This is in the waiting area, but they, they have put up temporary, you know, kind of partition walls for their city offices, but you still get a sense of what the grand lobby used to be like, um, throughout the floors and things like that. But the other thing that inspired us was uh, Deep River Falls. <coughs> they actually done that project. They were really familiar with how to do the reuse of a historic building for city purposes in their community. That when they were faced with what should we do about our old Carnegie Library, they didn't shy away from that at all. They actually go right back in and said, well, we need a space that could house a few small offices for uh, not city building or not city offices, but um, like their Chamber of Commerce or um, you know their local Convention and Visitors Bureau, things like that. Um, and then they um, they recognized like there's no place to have like a small wedding reception or a baby shower or things like that that aren't private facilities. We could really use a community space like that. So they rehabbed their library um, to accommodate that. They added an addition on the back that provided the accessibility um, and they uh, did some renovation on the interior. Um, and it wasn't an expensive project for you know, less than a million dollars. Granted, it's not a very big building either, but they did a very thorough rehab and as I said, they added on an addition to the rear that provided that accessibility, which is really needed. Um, it's mostly privately funded. They actually looked into the grant funding uh, funding that was available and decided against using that, um, partly because of some of the requirements and processes that it would have required from them. Um, so they just went out back to the community and said, hey, we need this so that we can rehab this building successfully, and they were able to get it. So now it serves as a multi-purpose small event center, um, offices, as I mentioned, 
And they also have a community technology lab as a way to bring people into the building and also provide a, a pretty needed um, resource in their community. This is the addition here that they added on. So it's pretty small in scale. Sorry, that slide is a little bit dark, um, but just provides an alternate entry. It's right accessible to parking too, um, and has that uh, elevator in it. And then there's the historic reading room is now available for smallish events. You know, probably accommodates no more than 100, 110 at the most. But um, super cool. It's a beautiful space. It's got really great light quality. These were obviously taken in the middle of the winter, and yet it's still a very bright and open space. And you can imagine what it was like here when it was a reading room for the library, too. You know, they still have the um, book cases along the side. Um, I always imagine this with a little cat running around, like a library cat, um, even though they don't have it. Um, <laughs> so um, we also. A lot of times people have uh, houses, and the Dewey Radke House in Little Falls is an example. There are houses that have uh, fallen in value, that are vacant, but that are clearly historic and probably have a story to tell and could be repurposed, but the city just feels really stymied in what to do about that. Um, Shoreview is a place that you don't usually think of. Can I ask a question? So what makes a house historic? Like the uh, okay. architecture. So, so I'll give you like, a pandemic. I don't know. Story. Like I don't know. Yeah, no, no, that's a good question. Um, I'll give you the pan definition of what makes a historic a, a house historic, and then I'll give you the official definition. All right then. Our definition is if it's old and you like it, it's historic. <laughs> um, we really think that community assets that people are invested in them, they're of value. Right. And they should be preserved. And there should be resources that either you're contributing or that you help get other people to contribute so that this place can continue to serve that vital community function in your community. And whether that's a house, a private house, or your school, or a coffee shop, or any other facility, if it's old and you like it, and there's a reason for it to be reused or it could be reused, please find a way to invest in it and we'll help strategize about hmm. that for you. Um, the official definition of what's historic is uh, depends a little bit on whether you're talking city historic designation, and there's a handful of cities, more than a handful, about 35, uh, through the, the state that have uh, historic preservation ordinances that help establish criteria for determining something historic. Uh, for listing in the National Register, which sounds like it would be more important, but in fact is actually um, a purely honorary designation. Uh, the standard is 50 years old or older, and then also having significance in one of four established areas. I actually didn't even prepare a slide about that, but hmm. uh, we can we can talk about that more if you need details on that. Hmm. It gets a little technical, mm -hmm. and part of it is it gets technical in a way that turns a lot of people off mm -hmm. from having to you know to doing this work because if you're having to follow all these standards and rules, well then wait what? I just want to love this place and invest in it. Um, so in some ways, it's better to do what Blanco did, which is jump in, do it, and then worry about, oh, is this historic or not? Well, OK. Mm -hmm. Now that we love it and we know that it has a future, then we'll say it is or isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but this house, clearly over 50 years old, I don't think it's actually listed in the National Register. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be, but I actually don't recall. Um, and uh, was you know, a Chaska brick, although Chaska is a far away from here. So it was just a local brick farmhouse. Um, and it's in Shoreview, which again is a place that you don't really think of as having a lot of historic resources. Although if you go back to you know mm -hmm. what Shoreview looked like 150 years ago, it was all to the extent that there was any development, farmhouses, barns, rural properties that supported that very rural <coughs> community at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they had this house. It was actually not too far from a new uh, fire station and city uh, city facility, and they decided, well, we could tear it down or we could find a new future. And so they invested not a huge amount of money, to, again, $290,000. Some people would spend that on their private house uh, to rehab this. And uh, it's owned by the city of Shoreview, but it's leased to a nonprofit housing agency um, that provides housing support. So it's really kind of nice, actually, to have this house that in itself is a model for housing support for their clients who come and are looking for help getting into affordable housing. Um, and it's just, you know, it's accessible. They made all of the entries accessible. The, the ground floor, which is where their clients would come to, is an accessible space. Um, upstairs is just offices, so they just left the stairs in place and people have to walk up there. Um, but it's just it's a really nicely mm -hmm. rehabbed um, house. 
the Lee Peck Larson house. You can see, you know, here's like, this is an old, old door. This is from, you know, like the late 1800s. And this little winding stair in the kitchen and things like that. But I, um, I love seeing all these historic details of the trim and a final cabinet and a water cooler. <laughs> like that, you know, you can, you can honor the character of the historic house and still have your modern function inside. Maybe it's not the most elegant, but it's still okay. Um, this is another one that we uh, profiled partly because it was a really great success story. It was a really excellent example of how a community can invest in a project like this. Um, and it's a really great model, we think, for a public-private partnership. This uh, used to be a, um, I think it was the first Church of Christ scientist in Fairmont, and uh, it was literally falling apart. The whole back wall was caving in on itself. It was designed by a very prominent historic architect, Harry Wild Jones, who has done a lot of houses and other buildings here in the Twin Cities. Um, I don't know how much he got out in greater Minnesota, but Fairmont um, got this little gem that he had designed and uh, the, it was and ended up being a county owned facility that is now managed by a nonprofit organization and it's very similar in that respect to Landmark Center which is where Pam has its offices um, which is uh, you know again county owned but there's a nonprofit that takes care of all the lease arrangements all of the special events um, contracts for the maintenance and things like that of the facility which is a really good partnership model I think um, this turned out to be only a $620,000 project, um, partly because they had significant volunteer investment. Um, all of the retired carpenters, retired masons, all of the folks that like had the, uh, the experience and manpower but didn't necessarily have a way that they were using that day to day, were able to invest in helping get, get, getting this building rehab, um, and it saved them about half of what it could have um, in terms of uh, the projected renovation budget. They did a full interior and exterior renovation. They reconstructed that rear wall that was falling in. Um, and now it's the multi-purpose community facilities. Uh, the last time I visited, it was actually set up for a baby shower, but they have arts events, concerts, uh, exhibits, things like that all the time. Um, this is the large, what used to be the sanctuary space, um, the large assembly space they constructed. I think it's actually on the opposite view. Um, these lights really unique that they have these kind of embedded into the arch. Um, so lots of unique architectural details in here. Oh, and I, they left this exposed too. This is uh, the truss system, which is really unique within the building, especially of a building of this age to have this laminated mm. curved truss. Um, they restored the stained glass. Um, all of these things really uh, brought this building back to prominence within the, the community architecturally and also um, in terms of its um, I did want to point out, and I guess I don't have a great slide of it, but um, essentially there's the same massing towards their back, like if we were standing looking that way to the back of us is where the elevator is. And so they actually kind of constructed the elevator shaft up in the middle, and then there's, there's the stairs that wrap around it. So it's also fully accessible um, and kind of goes down to a walkout basement in the back. Um, but as I said, Landmark Center was, essentially has been managed on that same model. Um, hopefully all of you are familiar with Landmark Center, have been there for a number of events because there's stuff going on in that building all the time from proms and weddings to swearing in ceremonies and naturalization ceremonies, which are my very favorite day at Landmark Center. We all stand around the top of the cortile and watch as all these people that are taking their oath of citizenship, which is really exciting. Um, but there's, uh, you know, the, the Scottish fair happens down there and the dancers are there and there's just a uh, lots of activity and uh, most people don't realize though that it's a county owned building that's supported by this uh, nonprofit partnership um, and it's really a viable model and you know there's uh, weekly concerts here in this uh, courtroom that's been renovated our offices are right on the opposite side of this wall um, and there's a number of other arts organizations down at the basement level though there's this great story about how this was saved from the wrecking ball. And part of it is because it takes citizen action. It takes people really committed to seeing a different solution for these places to bring that forward and to, to um, have the results that it does. So, you know, we have this as an example of what happened when people really invested in the 70s and 80s to see this through. And here we are, and you know, 25, 30 years later, and we can see that this is still a viable model. It was still worth doing. I have yet to see any community who's invested in historic preservation and said, I 
really wish we hadn't done that. That was kind of a waste of the time and money. <laughs> Literally, nobody says that. It's really worth it. It may seem like there's a lot of headaches and a lot of challenges to get to that point, which is why we are here to try to help facilitate that a little bit, but nobody regrets it. Um, I want to give a couple slides. I think I have a few minutes left about why this makes sense. Um, for one thing, these are historic resources that are assets in your community that are unique to your community, and they're not liabilities. They don't, don't think of them as liabilities. If you take away anything else, please take away these are assets that can be reinvested in rather than liabilities for your community. Um, it's also really, from the Green Stead City's point of view, anybody's point of view, but it's really wasteful to throw them away. To dump something this big in the trash has a huge environmental impact. Um, not only in the amount of landfill debris, but what it takes to get that debris to the landfill, um, and then what it would cost in terms of rebuilding on that site. Um, there's a, a preservation architect who said that the greenest building is the one that's already built, which is kind of circulating out there as common wisdom um, in the field. And we hope that more, pe more people inherently understand that and embrace that concept and find ways to reuse um, rather than demolish them. Um, there's a as preservation and not econ economist, sorry, preservation economist Donovan Ripkema, who has done a lot of analysis about um, <laughs> what the actual costs are of preservation and what the return on investment is for communities to preserve. Um, and he had uh, calculated um, some of the, the actual environmental impact. So to put it in numbers, for those of you who might be numbers people, I'm not, but I did my best to put numbers to the that it took the equivalent of 640,000 gallons of gas to build and operate a, a pretty normal size 50,000 square foot building. That's you know maybe the size of a smallish school building um, or a largish commercial building. Um, back when I first calculated this, gas was 350 a gallon, mm -hmm. and so that was you know 2.24 million dollars in gas expenses just to build that building. We're not talking about um, all of the labor and all that other kind of stuff. Um, this is just fossil fuel impact. Um, at $1.99 a gallon, which is the going rate, it's still well over a million dollars in fossil fuel impact just to build that building, not related to all of the other kinds of building materials and labor and all that kind of other stuff that went into that, investing in that construction. Constructing the same, a new building the same size would emit about the same amount of carbon dioxide as driving your car 2.8 million miles. I'm never going to get that kind of mileage out of my car. <laughs> so um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of investment. And then tearing down a building of that size creates 8 million pounds of uh, waste and equivalent that to uh, not recycling your soda cans, 21.7 million pop cans ending up in the trash is the equivalent of one building. Um, and again, you know, like we're all really pro-recycling. That's become part of our just standard operating procedure. Um, and yet, demolishing a building pretty much negates any of the effort that we've done in building our recycling programs um, in one fell swoop. Not too long ago, we were working um, down in, uh, not working, but we were uh, notified by um, a student at St. Olaf College, which is also my alma mater, who was concerned about the proposed demolition of one of the college's honor houses. Um, and when I did the math, I realized that by St. Olaf throwing this cat, this house in the trash, which they ended up doing, it negated their entire recycling effort for the whole year. It was like everybody on campus just decided they were going to throw everything out instead of throwing it in the recycling. Um, and that's a really big environmental impact that is never really discussed um, when people these, these decisions are being made. Um, this is for later, so I think I will turn it over to whoever is next on the speaking agenda. I think that's Mark, right now. Next up is Carolyn Holsey. Carolyn is the museum director uh, in Dassel and will be telling us about their great project that they uh, undertook there. And uh, Carolyn's super excited about it and we're really glad that she was able to come here today to share her story. I'm really super excited about it, so I'm going to put my timer on, <laughs> if I can, without being too, I'm not very... I've got a hook, it's all good. Okay, then. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to be here to talk about the Dassel History Center and Ergot Museum. 
And I just wanted to say that this project didn't happen overnight. It took about 15 years to go from the restoration of this National Historic Building to the addition that was put on to make it more accessible and usable for everyone. So I just wanted to say also that that shouldn't discourage you because it brought benefits all along the line. It built relationships, it brought community together, it offered opportunities for educational and cultural experiences and programs, and it certainly brought recognition to DASL and to preservation. It was a labor of love, which it almost has to be, by many volunteers, which has significantly impacted our community. Um, the Universal Laboratory building, this is how it was when we first got it, was donated to the Dassel Area Historical Society in 1992, and the society then donated it to the city of Dassel. The Historical Society took the responsibility to restore the building, and the city of Dassel uh, took the responsibility to pay the maintenance, the insurance, and take care of those kinds of things. And they were to hire a museum director when the time was right. So all of this was basically done by volunteers until 2001. So from 1992 to 2001, volunteers made this work. The city's support and ownership of the project was significant in bringing it to fruition. Without the city, the Historical Society would never have been able to get grants and to do um, the kinds of things that they needed to do to make it work, to get grants from other government organizations and other, uh, other kinds of organizations. So it would have never happened without the city. Um, the Universal Laboratories was named to the National Register of Historic Places in 1996. It is a four-level facility, which was used in the production of yeast and became an ergot processing plant. And since you all know about what that is, we will just jump over that. I was going to say, what's ergot? I thought it was escargot. I missed it. Oh, yeah, you're looking at it there. The ergot story is the reason that it was named to the National Register. And it is a fascinating story, and it's a timeless story, and it's a global story. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it, but who's keeping track of my time? Okay. Ergot is a fungus. So in Dassel, we celebrate fungus. <laughs> Ergot is a fungus that grows on grain. Here's a picture of it, if you can see it. Uh, and causes devastation to animals and humans. And you can see it. Where is that? Oh, yeah. See, it. Where is see it? this little, you can see these little black things. Uh, can you see them? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I can't see them very well from Hard, here. But yeah. it's, they're right up there. They're little black kernels of fungus that grows on basically rye. And if it's ingested in bread or porridge or something, you can get gangrene, you can hallucinate, you can die. And so it's a really big, dangerous thing through the centuries. Uh, but also, I want to also note that ergus is the basis for LSD, which I think is just an interesting <laughs> little part. I was going to say, it sounded <laughs> like it was something. Scholars something are now it. linking it to plagues and devastations that have occurred through the centuries throughout the world. The Salem Witch Trials uh, is one of those occurrences where they're saying now that's happened because people ingested bread with ergot in it. Huh. But that it also has alkaloids that could be used in medication. And the medicines made from ergot alkaloids constrict your vessels. So it was used, the medicine was used to save thousands of lives on the battlefield during World War II. It's used in obstetrics and in migraine headaches. United States pharmaceutical companies were purchasing their ergot from Europe until just prior to World War II. And then um, they closed the doors to shipping, and so uh, United States pharmaceutical companies had to find a domestic source. And so um, this Dassel man said, well, we can do that right here in Dassel. And so he educated farmers and elevator operators to send all their ergot grade to Dassel, and at the Universal Laboratories building, Workers separated the ergot from the grain 
and sold the Erga to the Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company in Indianapolis, and they, threw, they sold the clean grain on the grain exchange. When scientists developed a synthetic product to replace it, then um, the business kind of dissolved, and um, that was closed in the mid-70s. Since that time, the building was not used except for some storage. And in 1987, we looked at it to become the home for our historical <coughs> society, and it was in great shape. Five years later, it was in terrible shape. There was a hole in the roof, and everything was rotting on the inside. So it became, um, I, you know, I wish my photos were better, but they're old, and I can't help it. So we don't have many photos of the disaster, but uh, we do have some videos, and I didn't bring those along. But I'm going to show you, you know, just note that, oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, Thank help. you. Can you go back so, one? Should we back up? Yeah. Just a little bit, yeah, because that was super interesting. Okay, so the, there was holes in the floor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you Ergot, too, because you can see, whoops, so you can see the, the grains a little yeah. better there. Okay. So, um, note the bathroom. We will talk about it a little later. But it was, didn't have any electricity. There was a hole in the roof. And it was a haven for pigeons. And when we went in, um, pigeons were hatching, actually, in, in the building we went in. There was no electricity. There were no stairways. There were kind of little ladder things that went all the way up to the fourth floor. And that was a very, uh, they had a very large freight elevator, which was not operable. The restoration of the building took about seven years. Partnerships um, in funding were extremely important. We wrote about six grants and made about six presentations to grant committees and um, other government uh, bodies and organizations explaining the significance of the project and its possible impact on DASL and even the state of Minnesota. One of the things that we got grants, we got grants, but they, you know, if you're going to get grants, you have to have in your plan that you're going to have better restrooms. You remember the bathroom I showed you? We used that for many years where we had big stuff in the, in the Universal Lab building entertainment and programs, and we had one little bathroom. And so um, we knew that it was time to do um, something else. But oh, if you want, I'm in, I'm in, okay. So this is kind of a little thing about how we did this in, in phases. So in 1994 it started, I won't go through it all, but you can see phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, phase six, and then some added work. And at the bottom here shows how the, the funds were brought in. The grants to the state of, Min uh, state of Minnesota grants and aid program, we, had, we used that program. We got $173,000 from them, DAHS, and it supported the $151,000, and the city of Dassel turned in $119,000. So it was really, really a wonderful um, thing. We were raising funds. We tried to engage people to come in and look at the building and see the progress. So we had programs, and we had food. And we even had a harpist come into this old dilapidated building to make it, give it a little quality. And everybody was just um, part of that. And then it turned into a very um, much more interesting building. This is the restoration. And it shows. I like this. Does that say from blight to um From blight to, to blessing, blessing is, the, cool. is the title of our, of our exhibit on Urban. Nice. So we just um, did some things and <laughs> nice. Cool. It's kind of a museum, and we do lots of programming all over. Um, we the students come in and we give tours. We've had a couple of Smithsonian exhibits, and we're able to bring community in for those. We have theater performances up there on the third level, wonderful, wonderful theater performances. They build sets and everything without hurting the, um, the architecture in the inside. And uh, we were included on that legacy, civic legacy project too. And so um, the banner is up there somewhere back here, I think, but we celebrated and that was really fun. There you can see um, one of, uh, this is a banner that goes with 
the traveling banners for well, all of them are for the legacy, this legacy thing. Okay, so we continue to have programming um, up there. Um, we had a big piano exhibit. 28 grand pianos were brought into our building and we put them on all four levels and it was really fun. This is all in this building that we've restored. It was very exciting. Can I add how much fun it was to bring in 28? <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit of an issue and our volunteers said, don't do that again. <laughs> But we don't, we, we really don't say no to, to any opportunities. As time went on, we realized the importance of the work we were doing in genealogical research and archival collections, and our spaces were becoming too small. So we considered our plan to have accessible restrooms. That's why we built this new addition, because that was what we were supposed to do. Um, and we were drawing large crowds and one little bathroom was really bad. So we thought about a welcoming entry, a small kitchen, and wouldn't it be nice to have more office space and an archival storage room with heat and humidity control? <laughs> so we started planning for a, a new annex, which came off of this building. And as we planned, the city council said, well, we should add a community room for people to rent out for weddings and that sort of thing. So we thought that was great. I thought, I think many people, uh, especially in the, in the, on the board of the community, on the community council, DAPSO council, thought it'd be, it was great spaces and we should accentuate it. Again, it was fundraising and um, there were no grants available for new construction, so we conducted a capital campaign, making presentations to government bodies, organizations, and persuading members of the society that it was a worthy project. Construction began and was completed in 2009. Now we have a more welcoming entryway. We have a wonderful catering kitchen there. We have a welcoming entryway. I don't know how that second one got there. Um, we have office spaces. We have archival storage spaces. And this is the cost of what that um, and how, where the money came from. Um, so phase seven was the new annex and community room. Uh, total came from the Historical Society and the City of Dasso, and the community room, the, the city paid for that whole thing themselves. So we do lots of fun things there as well. And I, she, Aaron was talking about all the uses, and I've heard other things. And we have so much use for this facility. It's almost full every day and almost every night. Um, it hosts a variety of educational and entertaining and cultural and arts programming and exhibits. We do theater, music, lectures. It supports visual arts and area artists. The Dassel Township has its um, uh, home there, as well as the Dassel American Legion, the Senior Citizens Call It Home, the Likering Dancers, I'm, I'm missing my, we do theater, I said that. The Likering Dancers practice there almost every day of the week for seven years. The Lions Club meets there. Um, Mondays we do Mahjong, Tuesdays we do uh, 500, Wednesdays the senior citizens gather, two days a week there's exercises, exercise groups, and people come in to do genealog genealogical research. Tourist numbers are growing. Can you go back one, because that was just a beautiful picture that I really want that. <laughs> That's our, our Scandinavian dance group, right? Yeah, yeah. They're associated in our in that place as well. Thanks. And this is the room that they rent out for weddings and graduations and baby showers and birthday parties and family gatherings. And that's just becoming more and more prevalent all the time. We are big into promoting art. And so we do um, public art. And this is a fence mural that's right outside our building. And these are all uh, pieces that have been done by Dassel artists. We have this little mushroom building, we call it, on Highway 12, which is a landmark that directs people to the History Center. And we have um, music fair um, in the summertime, um, local with music, and people bring their lawn chairs and come. And so that's going on. And the businesses in Dassel are also revitalizing. Um, we've got new occasional shops. We have galleries. So honestly, I believe this all started from the preservation of this one industrial commercial building. It is just, it's just
just mushrooming it. It's just beyond you, anything I can imagine. We have always thought that that Dassel History Center and the Ergot Museum could become a wonderful and relevant community asset, as well as a historical museum and for the historical society, and it is just that. We have uh, approximately 50 talented and dedicated volunteers that make things work. The community <coughs> pride is stimulated as area residents bring their friends and family in, and we have found that people that have been there once bring other people back. So it is a very fun and interesting place. And now we have a track record. And as Aaron said, once you do something and you're happy you do it, you can go on and do other things as well. So we worked with Pam on saving the Dassel Creamery. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a very painful one for us as well. <laughs> but the Dassel Club Dairy Association owned it. And we, we had many discussions with them to say, you know, this would be a great building for you to have your store in, because that's what they wanted. They wanted a little store. And we talked a long time, but they went back to their original plan, which they had had for many years, to demolish it and put up a metal building. Mm -hmm. So that was hard. But now we have another plan, which I think is very exciting. Do you have a vision for this? Yes. Let's see, yes, you have to have a vision. <laughs> um, this is a this is a seed corn tower, and Dassel was once the seed corn capital of the world in the 50s and 60s. We now, had Dassel is 12. How large? 1400. 14. Wow. Yes. We have more uh, seed we have more seed corn companies per capita than any place else in the world. And so this corn tower would be a very historic and wonderful thing to restore. And uh, the vision of how it could be used, wow, art studios, galleries, office space. There's room for an intimate theater there. And we have theater in our other building, which is they have to bring stuff in all the time. That could be there. It could be uh, libraries. It could be the new city hall that you, <laughs> that you had mentioned. And actually, our administration is very supportive of it, and they want to move there. And so I think we have a really good opportunity. I'm just almost done, and I'm, I'm over. I'm so sorry. It's OK. Um, it's, uh, my experience says that rehabilitated commercial buildings can be very valuable civic assets, and they provide long-term rewards. Um, somebody said I should say what I've learned in the process. I've learned that you have to have a vision. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And everybody said when we worked on the other thing, you are absolutely crazy until it was over. And then they said, gee, this is really nice. <laughs> and so, you know, you have that. You have to have a vision, and then you have to be able to pursue it. Partners are so important. You can't do it alone. Preservation takes time. Be patient. It's worth the effort. Don't get up. Don't give up, but have a plan B. Grant writing is essential. Enthusiasm is vital, and volunteers are valuable. Yeah. Woo okay, can you go back to the mushroom house? Because that was like you went too fast, and that was I know. awesome. Do you understand why I did? Yeah, yeah, and that creamery, you're killing me with the building so that they did. It was a gas station? It was a little mobile gas station built in the 30s, right? So cute. Very, very cute. And it, oh my God. It stands right in the corner, so everybody that goes by it, knows that it. it's in that's in Dazzle. Adorable. And then the, we have a sign there that directs them to the Ergot, the history center. Uh -huh. And they, the creamery got demolished in an aluminum and building. A really just Ugly. lovely little, you know, Ugly. metal building. Yeah. This would have been so fabulous. Right. Thank you. Thank for you. Woo! Most applause ever at a workshop. Yeah. Most enthusiastic applause ever at a workshop. Yeah. Let me just say that. Uh, next up is Mark Larson, City Administrator from Glencoe. Now you've already heard a little bit about the clicker. Uh, Do you have the clicker? I don't want the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, and I, I uh, on one of Aaron and my trips around the state, uh, we did stop in uh, spontaneously at the Glencoe City Center. And if you're ever in the area and just wanting to see a different way that a school has been reused. It's really just fabulously well done. So when we were putting together this workshop and thinking about um, 
building some projects to showcase. This was definitely came top of mind. Um, it also, it also definitely in at least our world, as Erin said, uh, is a bit more of a unique story where, where you know, we all just did it, which was great. <laughs> it was great. So right. I'll let Mark tell more of this story. Okay, so Glencoe Graydon High School. Um, originally, I think she mentioned Henry Hill. That name got assigned to it. The Henry Hill School actually sat on the same property prior to 1932 when the Glencroke Graydon High School was built. So this building was built um, beginning of the Depression. Uh, they had a uh, bond referendum. Which one's supposed to push? No? No. Nope. Uh, Sorry. That, okay. It takes a second. Um, it was built in 1932. Here's a 1957 picture of the school. In 1957, they put an addition on the building. And part of the reason that we didn't go for historic uh, recognition at the time is that the 57 edition was of substandard quality and we didn't want to keep that part of the building. So this is the original footprint. This is a U-shaped building. Um, we acquired it from the school district in 2007 for a dollar. It was a very expensive dollar. After we got started. <laughs> uh, on the city council, I had two very ambitious city council members that were part of our historical uh, group, the Glencoe Historic Preservation Society. They wanted to save the building, so we took the building on. We had no real plans for what we were going to do with it. Uh, initially, we looked at loft apartments. We had different developers come through, and everything that we looked at wasn't what we really wanted. Um, we had built a new library back in the late 80s, about 88, so did we want a library? I don't know. We, we went around the state, looked at other renovated school buildings, and finally, we decided that we needed to do something because the building was starting to deteriorate. We had urban explorers going through the building. Actually, have to put no trespassing signs on it, or you can't charge them with trespassing. So we found that out. You can see uh, windows are boarded up, um, parts of the building. Um, the school had an alternative learning program that kind of took over the building. And there was very little uh, supervision. I mean, you can see. Oops, where's the light? That's the center. Okay. We have all these historic lights in the in the uh, auditorium. Um, kids were throwing basketballs at them, and, and they were broken. We had to uh, renovate all those um, as we proceeded with the project. But you can see um, signs of deterioration, uh, ceiling tile. Uh, there's no heat, no utilities in the building. The water and sewer, uh, water been drained. And um, you can see uh, suspended ceilings have been put in in the 70s. Um, all these half windows were put in in the 70s to, uh, for insulation, for energy efficiencies. Um, the ALP, Alternative Learning Program, a lot of graffiti on the walls. Um, Ceilings were leaking. I think she mentioned that in, in another project. Here's the original library, which is in the second floor of the building. This was the original library of the Graydon High School. Um, in 32, all 12 grades went to school at this building. Um, Glencoe, we are located about 45 minutes uh, straight west of uh, the Twin City area on Highway 212. Our population is about 5,700. Um, in the 50s, there were three bond referendums, bond referendums in which two, uh, two other schools were built and an addition was put on uh, this building. Again, see the deterioration, uh, the floors were buckling. Uh, in 2007, we hired a bonus drill uh, architect. We worked with them for about a year. We had a, a, a committee that was established. Original estimates were up around nine million, and Bonestro could not get the project down to what we thought was affordable at about five million dollars. Um, in 2008, 2009, a fundraising group was established, local foundation, the Hazy uh, Family Foundation, which is a local bank in uh, Glencoe, put up a $700,000 match with Security Bank and Trust. Uh, Hazy's owned that bank, 300000 so the goal was to raise about a million dollars. Um, 
exceeded expectations and raised about 1.25 million from nearly 500 different sources, including individuals, foundations, um, various classes that went to the high school over the um, period of time, business donations, local nonprofits, <laughs> our hospital, our light and power, um, and then the city of Glencoe. Um, we started construction in October of 2009, and we finished in August 20th of 2010. And I think we had our first wedding on August 21st of 2010, and we had, they had guaranteed them that the building was going to be done. So we identified uh, the project, and uh, we ended up taking what we were going to put as a ballroom here, and we put it into the existing um, uh, gymnasium auditorium area. You mentioned the Jackson School, my home school of Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, same architect. This last year, they put on a school edition, they tore down the auditorium, which was exactly the same thing. That's what was here, same architect. Um, we had our fundraising group. This is a councilman here, this is a councilman here, very, very established in the community. We took uh, one of the old high school principals, uh, the old business manager from the school, again, very respected people in the community, put them on this fundraising group. Uh, this is Gail Hazy. He is the president of Security Bank and Trust in the Glencoe, in, in Glencoe, the Story Preservation Society, he had t-shirts, and uh, the Lions Club was represented, and lots of people got involved. So we had a professional fundraiser that was the brother-in-law of this gentleman, came in and gave us lessons on how to go out and ask for money and fundraise, and then the group got started. So here are all the revenue sources. And when the project, we actually did about a, a $2 million bond issue uh, right in here. Once the project got started, we had to go out and do a, a, a temporary bond issue for another $700,000 because once we got the project started, we realized we needed a lot of equipment to make this building operate. And one of the toughest things that you'll find out when you do a major <coughs> rehab project like this we had a contingency fund of about 10%, which would be about, or about 5%, which is about 250,000. We actually spent about a uh, half a million dollars in change orders. I lived in this project for about two years, so I was there every day. And every time we opened up a wall, or every time we did something, we ran into, oh my goodness, we can't do what we wanted to do. Um, so here are the, basically the community donations. We did get a D grant for uh, public infrastructure, which completed the parking lots on the, on the, on the ground, security bank and trust, and then the anonymous donor uh, ended up being the Hazy Family Foundation. We had a, uh, a elderly lady die and left money to the library. We sold our existing library building. Um, the bond issued about $2 million. Uh, Glencoe Township in Buffalo Creek Watershed District. <coughs> are a part of our building. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has a room in our building, Lions Grant, um, and just some other. Uh, we sold the bituminous that uh, we crushed from the existing parking lot, and then one of the local townships just made a donation to the library. So it was about $5.4 million in revenues that we brought in. You can see here's our recognition wall. Um, we had 436 donations for 1.25 million. We let people make these donations over a three-year period of time. You get your name on the wall, you had to donate at least $1,500. And not all of these 436 donated that much. Of the 436 donations we received, only one did not follow through on their contribution. The community rallied around this, and they said, we want to save this building. And a lot of civic organizations um, jumped on board, too. Um, you can see here we started with demolition, and this is the 1957 edition. And again, that's why we did not put it on the historic register prior to. It was just low quality, and, uh, and it wasn't worth saving. And the way it, it fit on the building, we could not figure out what to do with it. And we didn't want it to have a lot of private um, business in here. I mean, we've got a lot of quasi-governmental agencies that we'll, we'll talk about as I continue here. Basically gutted it right down to the uh, concrete support uh, columns. Took all the old lockers out, made them into display cases. Um, you can see this is the old, this was uh, like stadium seating right here. 
So there's about a four foot stage in the auditorium. We filled that in. So there's about a, a one foot lip right up here. And you can see how the auditorium changed. We've got all, all the light fixtures were renovated. Um, we have seating for about 500 on the, uh, the floor and we've had uh, events that have had over 500 people in, in them. Um, you can see some of the other rooms. This is one of our, our conference rooms. This is the senior community room. Uh, this is the ballroom from the other direction. You can see there's about a one foot lip there. So it's a little bit of a, a trip issue, but um, we've got stanchions and we light this up uh, during events. Uh, new light fixtures. Uh, and always, these light fixtures were renovated. Uh, the old high school. <laughs> uh, this, this is on the, the end of the seat in the auditorium. What's the floor material? Um, give me a minute. I, it's like linoleum, but it's like it, no, it's it's not. It's a, it's tile. Is it tile? Yeah, Ama amaji. That sounds amaji. Something like that. That's only in the uh, entryway to the what we call the grand ballroom, and then the terrazzo floor is for the rest. Um, the Glenwood Co Area Chamber of Commerce is located on the first floor of Buffalo Creek Watershed District in Glenwood Township share office space. Um, to a little bit better picture, the, the, the lighting's not real good, but the Glencoe Public Library is on the second floor. Here's the building from the, the outside. New roof, new windows throughout. Um, Local Development Corporation made a donation for this message sign. Uh, it's original flagpole from 1932. See that's on there. Um, the West parking lot, again, we had a deed grant for 425000 uh, Every summer, the fire department holds a annual festival. It's called Heat in the Street. It's a country music festival that they hold on site. Um, Farmer's Market, there's a, a green area out in this area, Farmer's Market is going to be there this summer. They had to move uh, to some county property. Um, in 2011, after our project was done, um, we received a Historical and Cultural Heritage Grant, 2600. We hired Daniel Hoisington. In 2012, we were named to the historic, uh, National Historic Register. Now that allowed us to become eligible for new grants for that because we, we kept the footprint of that 1932. Addition. Um, two additional rooms were renovated in, in 2013 with 50% uh, matching grants, and then our local friends of the library. So two rooms upstairs were completed. Um, in 14 and 15, we received another one, 100% grant. You can see on the north wall of the building, this is where the 57 edition was attached. So there were a lot of holes in the wall that needed to be filled in. We had a we had a lot of uh, sparrows living in the, in the walls. Um, any more time and, and we would have started losing some of that north wall. Um, we've got a courtyard. Again, it's a U-shaped building. We've got a, a courtyard, which we use for outdoor weddings and, and uh, uh, or overflow during wedding events. Um, the Glen Folk Historic Preservation Society completed their history room. A lot of built-ins in that room. They've got a lot of displays. There are two rooms upstairs on the north end that are really tough to access for the public. So they've got a lot of their um, historical items stored in those rooms. Um, the most interesting one started in 13 and 14. The old lunchroom in the basement, the kitchen, uh, a local group, the Glencoe Woodworking Club, of which are about I think 60 members now. Wow. I took over that kitchen, and then there was another accessible room in the basement um, for their assembly room. Now they've taken the old coal room, which is in the <laughs> way basement, for their storage of all their lumber. And this group, we didn't think it was going to be a good fit, but it's been amazing. <laughs> I mean, you hardly ever hear them down there, but they're there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're, so they're using like woodworking power tools underneath your city mm -hmm. offices. Yeah, you see the big uh, table saw right here. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah, and the, the floors are concrete floors, and 
may have done some things to insulate. Um, we took an old uh, room that kind of was underneath the basement uh, steps, and uh, uh, we've got a restroom in the basement. The old actual lunch room in the basement uh, has a concrete floor, basically just painted the walls, and, and we let nonprofits use that for nothing. The Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, 4-H clubs. Um, the American Legion has now got storage here, and they have their meetings here because they used to meet at the VFW. Their members are getting older. They had to meet in the basement. It's not accessible. Um, we did construct an elevator. Um, there was an elevator in the old school when we purchased it, but it was not in a location that really fit for um, for our project. And I can go Actually, the elevator shaft is right here, and that's all it is, is an elevator shaft that is not used. We don't certify it, um, but we do have an, uh, another elevator located in a stairwell, and uh, that is a public um, elevator. And here is the elevator shaft, actually, right inside the building, and this is the entrance to the library after hours, and they take the elevator up to the second floor. Um, I think uh, Aaron had mentioned Pioneerland Library Systems is, is the plan, it's a library uh, group that we're associated with. The director at the time was absolutely not in favor of this. He did not want a second story hmm. library. Uh, there are two stairwells that are used to access the library along with uh, this elevator. After hours, they have gates that they pull across those stairwells and, and, and they only use this area. Uh, we have, I think, one of the most beautiful libraries in the state. For our size community, it's huge. Mm -hmm. it, it basically takes the entire second floor. We ha except there are one, two, three rooms that are not, they're just not access accessible to the public, and we're not sure how we're going to use those. Um, we just had some music up a long time. Um, <coughs> this, this is a door on the north side of the building. Uh, this is the one wing, this is the, the northwest wing. Um, we have a uh, common cup, it's like a food shelf, just moved into the last room on this uh, end of the building uh, within the last two months, and they've been fixing that room up. And uh, I think um, she mentioned in her presentation the building's used all the time. It's amazing. It's used all the time. Sure. We have all sorts of functions. We have uh, senior citizens meet there. Uh, Bone Builders, which is an exercise group, meets there. The Lions Club meets there. The Legion meets there. Um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H groups. We have weddings. We probably have about 30 weddings a year. The only thing that's holding us back on having more is we don't have a real good hotel in town. So we're trying to get that done. Um, I did show a picture of it, but you see the big hood here. We have a beautiful catering kitchen. I mean, it's got a commercial dishwasher in it. and. Um, I don't know. It's it's a wonderful building, but like I say, it takes a lot of people to put this thing together and make it happen. And uh, that's our building. And if you're in Glencoe, stop in and we'll take you on it. Nice. So I'm sure by now you're all wondering, how can I get this going in my community? <laughs> um, and so we're here to present a few ideas for some resources. Obviously, one of the challenges to doing work with unique assets and unique uh, communities is that all of the conditions are different. Um, it's really hard to have a standard model that you can implement. You really need to know what your community capacity is, what are the unique challenges of this building, what are the unique opportunities of your economy. Um, things like that. And so uh, we can present a whole range of tools and tricks and, and resources that you might be able to, uh, to use, but because each uh, condition is different and each community is different, the best way to, to develop a plan is to really engage with us and go one-on-one -on -one and figure out um, how we might be able to support you. So uh, just some of the resources. I think one of the things that's really critical is both making a plan but also developing um, some aptitude and some, uh, some energy around this concept in your community. And I think that's something that a city really could lead 
at and saying, let's look at um, historic building reuse. Let's look at our existing assets and figure out what we could do with that. Um, and to develop a plan, a way of actually really I mean, systematically or not, depending on how, how engaged you're going to be in this, but, but think through what are our options, what are our assets, um, and how can we go about this. Um, one of the things that I try to, to convey to people is that the preservation, and you probably heard it from Mark and from Carolyn, preservation doesn't happen by accident. If you leave it, leave it to market forces, you're not going to preserve things in your communities, most likely. Um, it really takes attention and design and commitment to lead in that way. Um, one of the best preservation success stories in our region is down in Galena, Illinois, which um, in the late 1960s was a struggling river town. Their industries had evaporated. Um, they knew that they were isolated in a way that was really not going to continue to um, develop their economy. And they looked around and thought, what do we have that's unique that we have to offer the world and what should we do about it? And they looked and said, well, we've got all these old buildings. Maybe we should invest in those. And they did, and they saved it themselves. Um, this is a small town of you know, like 5,000 people. It's not a huge place. They have a number of historically significant uh, houses, US Grants House, and um, a number of other uh, landmark, truly landmark historic properties. But they also just have all of their downtown fabric. And they decided, this is our unique asset. This is what we should invest in. Let's make a plan, and let's get it done. And at the height pre-recession, um, they were getting 3 million visitors a year, um, supporting a whole bunch of local businesses, everything from bed and breakfast to antique shops to cafes to uh, all of the tourist kind of destination-y stuff. Um, maybe to the point of overtaxing their small community with that many visitors, um, it's probably even out more <laughs> a little bit since then, and it's a little more sustainable. But my point is, they had to intentionally make a plan for how this is going to happen, and then pick away at it so that they could rebuild through their future. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Lanesboro and the recent success that Lanesboro has, ex has experienced. That wasn't by accident, and it was partly what is our unique asset, our bluff country location, our art community, and these unique resources that we have here is what our plan forward is, and we'll invest in that. I was in Lanesboro 20 years ago, and it was sleepy and dead. <laughs> It's not the same place anymore, but again, you have to make a commitment to doing that. As Carolyn explained, even one catalytic project can lead to a lot more investment and a lot more enthusiasm about re-engaging in this kind of work in other properties in a community. So one of the ways that cities can actually promote preservation as a value within their communities is to amend their count plan so that it includes preservation language. Uh, both Minneapolis and St. Paul have done that. I know that smaller cities have as well. Um, there are tried and true strategies for building reuse um, that can be adopted and codified and, and help guide the city policymakers forward. Um, there's also a historic preservation ordinance or a heritage preservation ordinance that could be adopted by your city if you don't already have one, which establishes um, the intent of designating and protecting properties in your community, um, establishes a commission of, uh, you know, public uh, citizens that will serve on a commission and help guide that process um, and then make sure that they're committed to doing that work um, and help guide uh, preservation efforts forward. Uh, so those are two things from a planning perspective that can happen. Yeah, question. Do you have a model ordinance? Uh, the question was, do we have a model ordinance? There are some available. The State Historic Preservation Office is really the ones that have uh, the best resources on this, but I can certainly point you to them. Um, know who your partners are. Um, as Carolyn said, it takes a lot of people to do this work su successfully. So think about who your natural and maybe not natural partners might be in an effort like this. Uh, Minnesota Design Team is one that Emily is really well familiar with. It's a, a, a department. It's not quite the right word. It's a, it's a, 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 a committee of the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota chapter, and uh, they come to smaller communities and help think through some of the design issues. Um, and how buildings can be identified as assets and then reused to, um, or, or you know, new construction occur, all kinds of hosts of things, anything design related essentially, um, to help uh, a community achieve its goals. Green Step Cities is obviously a partner to help um, promote best practices. As Carolyn demonstrated, your local historical society is a partner. Your city itself is a partner. Um, the local private sector, developers and banks and entrepreneurs and business people 
find out what their needs and desires might be and see how to lead them towards, um, towards considering opportunities for building reuse. Um, if you need some help in, in developing this concept within your community, that's what we're here for. We, we can't build your community building the people in the networks for you. What we can do is help support their efforts. So um, we're small enough so that we can't do anything for anybody <laughs> very effectively, but we're here to be a support and here to help um, to guide you in those efforts. Um, we have a number of different programs. Um, we have our education uh, program, which has how-to classes and workshops for property owners and homeowners. Uh, we have more in-depth classes for professionals, things like how to navigate the historic preservation tax credits that are available. Um, one of the things that I hope will take off eventually in Minnesota is, uh, is uh, developing small businesses around preservation trades. Um, in Michigan, recently they, well not recently, but a few years ago they had a historic windows workshop that actually trained enough people in doing historic windows repair that now there's a whole statewide network of small business operators that do historic window repairs throughout the state. Uh, so this is a really great uh, entrepreneurship opportunity, I think, for people in preservation trades um, to provide those kinds of things. So hopefully we will be ramping up to uh, train people at that level over time. Um, we can support, uh, through our education program, we lead tours and other community engagement events um, to, to really help, again, build this, uh, this ethic and this mindset of, of engaging in places like this through your community. And then we also have a really unique program for realtors, uh, continuing education certified by the state for realtors, we call it Old Home Certified. Um, and that's a way for the realtors in your community to get to know um, historic properties, how to identify historic architecture styles, how to sell and, um, and help, and buy, help buyers um, in identifying you know, what's a money pit versus what just needs a little bit of freshening up, how can they stage properly, so that it really uh, helps to highlight their historic assets, um, understanding the ins and outs of historic designation and things like that. Um, so it's a really great two-day class. Most of the, our offerings have been in the Twin Cities, but we are trying to get out to greater Minnesota. Um, and so we are looking for uh, community partners actually to help bring uh, that, those courses to, uh, to regions of the other regions of the state. Um, Minnesota Main Street is uh, Emily's I was going to say former program because she's been promoted to a new, uh, a new position and we actually just hired a new Minnesota Main Street coordinator. Um, but that is a, a, a whole way of helping support commercial revitalization in a community uh, through a very, very tried and true established approach. Uh, the, the Main Street four point approach initially developed by the National Trust for Historic Preservation has been in existence now for what, four decades? Almost, almost four decades. Like this is, this is the tool, this is the, the somewhat programmatically developed approach to doing this work. And, and one of the, the basic points of it is it's incremental. You take initial steps and then you build from there. Um, and over time, you see the results. Um, and Main Street communities um, are growing gradually in Minnesota. We've got eight, seven, seven designated Main Street communities um, and a whole network of others that are considering Main Street uh, designation. And, um, and we hope that one day we will rival Wisconsin or Iowa, which has like 39. Um, and then, so, you know, ways for them to really promote and develop uh, commercial revitalization in their historic downtown. Um, we provide strategic visioning and planning services for communities, helping with, you know, helping them understand, is this a historic resource that's worthy of preservation? What would it take to do that? Both from a technical, like nuts and bolts, uh, capital, uh, point of view and also like what do you need to get people on board with this concept. Um, we can provide grant writing assistance. Um, we can provide fundraising support. We're able, as a 501c3, we are able to serve um, as a conduit for tax deductible donations for emerging groups. Um, most recently in Jasper, Minnesota, which is south southwestern Minnesota, there has been a community-led campaign to purchase their old Jasper school building. Um, and revitalize it. And it was one of those things that was going up for auction and people kind of panicked. That, oh, we might lose this building. Got a group of people together, used us as their fiscal sponsor, and they've raised $40,000 to secure the future of this building. So that was a, almost an overnight success story. Um, it was a very, very quick fundraising campaign, but we're proud to have played a role in helping them out. Um, we have also just recently hired two new community engagement staff. And one of the 
that's so uh, gratifying about the work that we do is that we know that through preservation efforts, people get to know each other. They understand their communities better. They understand how uh, their government process works. They understand what their neighbors' needs and wants and issues might be. They, they really come together. Um, I had given a presentation a few years ago in Litchfield, Minnesota, where I looked around at who was in the room, and it was a retired homemaker, um, a retired banker, a shoe saleswoman, a farmer, a whole bunch of people who probably wouldn't be rubbing elbows on a day-to-day -day basis if not for their common concern about this building, which at the time was the Litchfield Opera House. So historic resources and landmark properties have the ability to bring people together that otherwise might not have an opportunity to do that. Um, and then if, when you add into the activities that might occur in that building, again, you have op many more opportunities for people to know each other and to really strengthen those social bonds, which are what really support, support our community fabric. Um, so we are interested in exploring all kinds of ways to engage with people who are interested in places. It's not necessarily all about the buildings and the, the places themselves. We want to support the people in their efforts on that. Um, so we're exploring a whole bunch of ways to do community engagement work. Um, you can also really develop your staff um, and make a commitment to engaging and investigating preservation as an approach for your city. Tons of continuing education opportunities out there. Um, the Minnesota chapter of the APA um, has an annual conference that usually has some kind of uh, presentation on building reuse um, or preservation. Emily and I have given sessions at that in the past. I don't know if that's on our work plan this year or not, frankly, but um, it's entirely possible that it would be. Um, I forgot to include on here the Minnesota AIA, but they have an annual convention as well that usually has um, some sessions devoted to um, understanding building reuse. Uh, the League of Minnesota Cities Convention, I again don't know if we have it on our agenda this year to attend, but we've annually had a booth there for the last several years, so we're there to interact with people and um, learn about issues and see if there are uh, strategies that we can help develop to be successful. There's an annual preservation conference. Uh, this year is going to be held in Hastings. This is produced by the State Historic Preservation Office at the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, but this is a great way for people um, in your communities to get an introduction to the ideas and concepts of historic preservation. It's just a two-day uh, conference, um, and, and there's, uh, it's a great networking opportunity, too, for people who are doing this. There's also a great national preservation conference um, that this year will be held in Houston, Texas, um, which is a little more in-depth, but especially if you want an excuse to get out of Minnesota in early November, uh, you can go to Houston and, uh, and learn about preservation from a national perspective. Um, the upcoming Main Street Conference in, is in Milwaukee, so just <laughs> over the border, um, at the end of May, which is another, and Emily's been there several years, so she can tell you all, all about how uh, the enthusiasm that permeates that particular conference and how excited people get to attend. Um, so lots of ways to just go and develop people's uh, awareness. Yes, question. We might also want to look into connecting with the U.S. Rebuilding Council's um, impact conference for every Okay, the Cone Street building, you know, also promotes building reuse. Right, right. So the comment just for the webinar folks was uh, to look into the U.S. Green Building Council's annual or impact conference every other year or so um, to, to uh, for additional continuing education or development opportunities. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we talked a little bit about all of the sources of funding support that are out there. Um, there is a lot of grant support, and I said the legacy funds, the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Funds administered through the MS, uh, Minnesota Historical Society are a really, really good pool of money that should be accessible to every community in Minnesota. Um, they're available for survey and inventory. Survey and inventory is essentially looking around your community, taking a pretty systematic look at what do we have that might be of value? How do we know if it's of a value? And I mean, you can rule things out in terms of historic designated value too, but you still might have a way of identifying uh, what those assets are. Uh, National Register designation is the, the next step in that process. If you find things or an area that is of historic value, then you can have it nominated to the National Register. There's benefits that come with that. As Mark explained, now that the Glencoe uh, School is on the National Register, they can apply for capital improvement grants through the Legacy Fund. Um, so having a property that's on the register that's publicly owned or owned by an area nonprofit, 
is a great way to access the capital improvement funds that are available. Um, for privately owned properties that are listed in the National Register, if they are income producing properties, they qualify for historic rehabilitation tax credits. Um, and uh, we have a state fund or a state tax credit as well as a federal credit. The federal credit has been in existence for decades. Uh, the state credit was passed with Pam's help um, in 2010. Um, we are really, really proud to have achieved that after 11 year lobbying effort to try to do a uh, grassroots, very grassroots lobbying effort to make a point for investing in historic resources and invest in the state's economy and invest in the workforce development of our state. Um, preservation keeps jobs local. More money is spent in local uh, in wages and in labor for preservation money or funds than are for new construction. Um, because you're not buying drywall and lumber and steel from China or Canada or Sweden. You're investing in the work power of people who are pipe fitters and uh, plasterers and uh, floor refinishers and window glazers and all of the people who are actually doing the labor rather than buying the materials. So that's a really, really sound investment. Um, they have been done doing annual studies. Part of the part of the legislation requires an annual assessment of the economic benefits of this program. And uh, all of the years that it, they've done this uh, assessment so far, I think it's turned returned like a nine to one investment to the state. So for every dollar that the state is expending in a tax credit, it's returning nine dollars of income to the state, which is a pretty good return on investment. And that's not even I don't think that's even attributing the like trickle down effect of uh, generating money in the local economy. Um, so there's a 20% rehabilitation tax credit for the state as well that can be paired with a 20% federal rehabilitation tax credit. So um, it gets a little detailed and, and there's a lot of qualifying factors, but definitely something to use to promote private development in your communities of uh, designated historic resources. And there's uh, brochures on the back table to take to that. Emily has, is that what you're going to say? Brochures. Okay, yeah, brochures on the back. Um, reuse studies. A lot of times, even if you've identified something as a, as a viable asset, you don't know what to do with it. Like, as to Carolyn's point, we have the seed corn building. What do we do with it? A reuse study is a pretty standard way in the preservation field of looking at what your alternatives are and considering both the architecture. As, and the condition of the building, as well as what will the local economy support, and what are the needs of the community? What are the things, the ideas, and, um, and willingness of the community to invest in doing that? Um, that's another kind of activity that is often funded uh, through legacy dollars. Um, many communities throughout the state, when they have identified their historic resources, want to promote that, have done so, so through walking tours. Um, this is a way to promote heritage tourism and small business development and all the things that tourism supports in a community. So those can be supported with legacy dollars. Um, there's other sources of funding for things like small uh, facade loans and grants that can go to, um, to just boosting up a building's exterior appearance. Small cities funds have typically been used for this. Um, and uh, I don't know what the status of, of that program or how, uh, how to access those monies right offhand, but we can always look into it for you and give you some tips. Um, I'm just not as connected to that network right now. And, uh, and legacy partnerships. There's been a lot of instances of cities getting money on behalf of private property owners if there is a connection between the city's like, economic development authority and that property. Um, so for example, the Faribault Woolen Mills down in Faribault, at one point, uh, the city's EDA um, had given a pretty substantial loan to that building um, when it was still operated previously as the wool mill. Then, as all of you hopefully know, the story of this landmark mill, mill in the state, it uh, closed for a couple of years, it was substantially flooded, it was purchased, rehabilitated, is now back operating as a mill. Um, but there were some needs that needed to be, uh, some capital improvement needs to the building that were really kind of outside of the scope of what the new owners were wanting to take on. Um, and were mostly there to protect the historic character of the building, not necessarily to promote the functionality of the building. Mm -hmm. And so the EDA went to the legacy fund and applied for a grant to, I think it was to repoint and stabilize the chimney on the property and to do something else. And because they had this long-standing relationship, they were able to access those funds on behalf of the private owner. 
So there's ways that partnerships can be developed that will actually bring state dollars to a privately owned property if you do it right. Uh, here's another just teaser about the state um, historic re structure rehabilitation tax credit. And again, it's a way, obviously, because cities can't do everything for their cities. They can't take on all of the burdens of building reuse. Um, but there's ways to incentivize and promote private investment in, in buildings that um, that can be equally successful and lead to all of the same outcomes that you want. Um, so I think that is my last slide. And I think any of the three of us would be happy to entertain questions if you have them. Yes? Sorry if you mentioned this already, but several of the presenters talked about deed funds. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they could expand upon what that what those grants are all about yeah the question was about deed funds and i'm going to put mark on the spot actually if i could ask you to come back up here so, so that the webinar folks can hear you so and also so that it'll take your voice um and answer that to see your answer. beautiful shirt <laughs> salmon it's a good color um yeah we did receive the deed grant which is the department of um, employment and economic development state level um on the west side and the east side of our building we have two parking lots the east and west of the east side used to be tennis courts and uh, there were some soil conditions there on the west side we had a large uh, storm sewer pipe that ran through the, the old playground of the building um, there was available a public infrastructure grant through deed um, that we applied for it was about four hundred twenty five thousand dollars and as long as we we had the matching monies that we put into the overall project and uh, I guess that's the only deed money that uh, was available, and it, it fit their criteria. Thank you. Um, just one other comment. Um, our building was supposed to cash flow. It did not cash flow. City Council it understands that. It's just like our parks now. I mean, it's part of our general fund, basically, that to operate the library, the city offices, and the facility as an event center and a city center, um, it's going to cost the community not only for debt service, but also for the operation. Um, I'm, I'm probably mistaken in this, but hopefully not, is that I think small cities funds are also through seed. Yeah, and so that's another uh, fairly good source. And um, those are actually federal pass-through grants. And so there is, uh, when you're looking at national register, either listed or eligible properties, there's a little bit of uh, compliance work that needs to occur, but um, don't let that scare you away because there's a source of funding out there that I think is under underutilized um, in terms of um, access for, for preservation kind of projects. Yeah. There's a question over here. Yeah, the question, question about loan uh, loan money, many of, well, actually all these projects have a mix of uses in them, although none today were described with housing, but if we were to go back 20 or 30 years ago, it was very difficult to find that. For the bank financing, for um, uh, sort of state and federal money to uh, finance, and also insurance issues where you have different uses of the building. Has that substantially changed? Yeah, so the question was about loan financing, and especially when you have a mix of uses with housing and other uses. Usually housing. Commercial. Yeah, and my understanding is that hasn't really changed. Emily might have some more information about that. Um, one of the things that's really um, really challenging for, for historic preservation and I think for any uh, development that's supposed to be community-based and centric is that uh, the modern economics of our real estate market do not support preservation and small business uh, development <laughs> just because of, um, because of the realities of what uh, major developers have to do in terms of um, underwriting their loan like that, the cash flow, you know, uh, one of the, I think one of the real threats to uh, smaller buildings that have a number of established uh, small businesses in them is, is that when those sites are proposed for redevelopment, there's really virtually no way to keep those small businesses in place because they can't guarantee a lease long enough to meet the underwriting needs of the, of the building uh, loan contractors. Yeah, so that, that whole capital the real estate and small, it's just really out of whack. 
um, and I don't really know how to address that. <laughs> There's something that we can say now. There's a lot of things that we can't. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a, kind of a big issue. But Emily, it sounds like she has some ideas in terms of the uh, loan stuff. I just wanted to, to okay. <laughs> I just wanted to to confirm what Erin said. That last I heard, the the loan loan making or financing for mixed use buildings that have to have commercial and also housing was still very difficult. And that you had to do, uh, you basically had to do the loan. The loan had to work on the housing side or on the commercial side. You could not look at both of them together to see if the loan would work. You had to have it be, you had one, had to have one or the other support your financing, which is really difficult. And also is part of why a lot of the, the redevelopment commercial spaces end up with uh, requirements for 15 year leases. Uh, which is, is, you know, one thing for like, you know, Jimmy John's to sign a 15 year lease on, on a space, but it's another thing for, you know, the day by day cafe to sign a 15 year lease on their space. So that's, that's one of the, the things that Aaron was talking about in terms of hurdles for small businesses. Yeah. I just want to make a comment on, on grants. Um, there are a lot of strings attached to grants. <laughs> um, the deed grant that we got, we had to have our city engineer um, basically um, administrate that grant application because there are prevailing wages that come along with state dollars and you have to the reporting requirements that are that need to go back to the, those agencies that say you are paying prevailing wages even on the two legacy grants that we got after we came on the National Historic Society um, one was a hundred percent we still had to hire an engineer to design that, so and those engineering costs are not eligible. So even though we got 100% for the north wall of the building, we still had about another 12, 15,000 that we had to come out of our pocket to pay for our engineer. Again, not only to design it, but then to administer that grant because of the prevailing wage requirement. Um, the other grant we got legacy money was a 50-50 matching. Luckily, we had a, uh, a friend of the library that had monies in their accounts to pay for that half. We had to hire a construction manager to basically administer that and another, about another $8,000. He's a local contractor that had actually was our construction manager on our big project. But again, there's, there are strings attached and, you get, and a lot of reporting requirements on how the money was spent. Well, and back to the, you know, the, the loan models and, and other things. One of the things I think that we're interested in, Pam, is hearing from people about the challenges to doing this work, you know, especially if there's public policy changes that could or should be made um, that would help promote this. And one of the, the things that I guess that strikes me as a little bit ironic is that, um, you know, in 2010, when the state rehabilitation tax credit was passed, we said, we were now committing to this as a matter of state policy that we believe historic preservation is a good thing. And all of the reasons why we think that's a good thing. Well, if that good thing is not being supported by a whole bunch of other plan decisions that are also supporting that good thing, then we need to hear about what those hurdles are so that we can go back and hopefully get some policy changes that will say, this is what we committed to. These are all the things that are standing in the way and how can we help advance that commitment? If that's truly what we intended was to promote historic preservation as an economically environmentally, culturally sound way to promote uh, reuse and a, a redevelopment in our communities. So, you know, we're, it's, it's a conversation. <laughs> let's, let's continue talking about it if there's reason. Uh, if there's things that we're identifying as this is one of the things that gets in the way that keeps this from happening, let's see if there's a way to, to find a solution for that. I wanted to say a few things before uh, doing a last call for questions to Diana for wrap up. Uh, and one of those is that as part of PAM's uh, partnership in Green Subsidies, we are offering um, 10 hours of staff consulting um, to two cities. Um, I think was it that are attending the workshop or <laughs> this part of the deeper going deeper. I don't remember exactly. Anyway. So it's limited. Uh, we don't have a, a very set plan for how <laughs> we're equitably distributing these hours. So if you want in on them, 
uh, contact us shortly <laughs> to guarantee your safe. <laughs> so people on the webinar. Right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and you know, when those 10 hours are up, you then otherwise you would be working with us on our e-based system of consulting, which is still super affordable. But uh, I also wanted to say that uh, this is all part of uh, best practice number five in green subsidies, building redevelopment, um, especially actions one and three for adopting a historic preservation ordinance to encourage adaptive reuse and also planning for the reuse of large retail or other large buildings such as schools in your communities. And so you've seen some examples of those today. Um, so, okay. Any other questions for Diana? All right. So it's 11 o'clock, it's time to end. Um, thank you so much for those on the webinar and those in the room. Um, a special thanks to Excel Energy, our series sponsor for the whole workshop series. Um, we have a couple more workshops. We have one in May, the transit assistance options. And then in June, we have a special workshop in conjunction with the League of Minnesota Cities Conference that will include a tour of the Eco District in St. Paul. So super exciting. So sign on. I'm sorry. In person only, uh, you cannot tour the eco district via webinar. Well, we <laughs> turns out, like, you know, we can do that virtual reality. reality. <laughs> I'll wear it and then they can see whatever I see. No. Yeah. Um, so, and then I forgot to mention the hashtag Green Step Workshop. We've been tweeting a little bit today, pictures and announcements. I just tweeted the 10 hours uh, for Green Step City attendees, workshop attendees. So, um, really excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next month. That's a wrap.